Welcome, welcome, welcome back to Silicon Valley Video. As those of you who've been here before know, I'm Marty Porter. I'm the character who sort of dreamed this up and started talking to you folks out in the Bay Area about uh, organizing a community of video types and video geeks who produce, engineer, um, broadcast, and video for the big tech companies and, and those who uh, do business with the big tech companies. Um, I work with Sports Video Group, SVG. You wonder, what does SVG have to do with this? Well, you know what? Um, 15 years ago, we formed a community of sports geeks, sports technology geeks, and we're hoping to do the same thing. Something called the pandemic sort of got in the way, but we kept, we forged on. And about two years ago, I, I came to uh, uh, San Jose, Silicon Valley with Tom Baldessari from b and and went around and met a lot of you guys. And it was just great experience. And everybody said, you know what? You know, you got to talk to Dave Van Hoy. You guys, you guys got to meet this guy, Dave. He knows everybody. Everybody's worked for Dave. Dave's built everything. You got to meet Dave Hoy. And I said, wait a minute, Dave Van Hoy. Is that the Dave Van Hoy that I knew at Sound Genesis back in the old days? And it turns out that we knew, knew each other way, way back from the audio days. So it was great, not only connecting with a lot of you, but connecting with Dave. And, uh, and Dave has always... Uh, been on the cutting edge, the bleeding edge of things. And besides, like this new technology that we're talking about, and inevitably his company, ASG, would come up, I'm sure would come up with, with something that would sort of blow our minds and get us excited about a full presentation. And uh, here we are, because Dave and his team at ASG um, came up with something they call, they fondly and uh, really, it's a catchy name. It's called the Virtual Production Control Room, right? The VPCR. I, you know, I call it Dave, you know, because it's easier just for me just to call it Dave. So Dave, you know, I know, I know you're a shy and modest guy. Well, you know what? I know I'm calling it Dave, the digital audio video ecosystem. That's what I'm calling it. But you call it what you want. We're about to get a tour from Dave and Hoy, the guy who designed this and the guy who runs ASG. So let me just hand it over and Dave, take it away. Thanks, Marty. And, uh, it's fun. I mean, it's hard to believe all those years ago, you know, when you were launching those first magazines and, and I was, I think I was two years old, but uh, the uh, it's, it's, it's fun to get to continue to do new stuff. Uh, and, but first and foremost, before we really get started, I want to thank the team uh, today with me are some of the key folks who've been instrumental in putting this together. And I'll give you a bit of a history in a, in a moment here, but uh, I think we have on uh, Marissa Dorn, our, our rock star A1, uh, Mike Shaw, who is a, uh, who, who uh, no, the TD that seems to be scared by nothing. And uh, Adam, who has just been uh, on the audio side, just all over on, in terms of comms and coordinating audio with Marissa and uh, Jan, who uh, we, we, definitely could not have done this without Jan. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know that I can actually describe all of Jan's role other than to say truly uh, a cloud systems architect, uh, which uh, you know is a, a new skill set th that all of us have to have as we move forward. And uh, Tim Cuthbertson, who leads our uh, cloud production group, and uh, Bill Crooks, who manages our uh, engineering team at, in one of the groups that we operate at Google, and uh, another one, Marty, I think I've known Bill about the same amount of time as you. Uh, and I think uh, it goes back to the original Atari. And uh, Todd Junkin, who has been instrumental in staffing many of our, uh, putting together many of our solutions, who's been around our industry a long time and was the key leader in putting together our video that we'll be uh, presenting today. And uh, I think that's the... The, the, the main folks we'll start with from there. So the genesis behind this, before I kind of launch into the deck, was as the pandemic was ramping up, I kind of looked and had a pretty panicky moment. The, you know, the part of our business today is that we are very lucky and we get to run production services and engineering in many groups at many companies, including Google and Yahoo and Spotify. And as we were going into the lockdown, my, my moment of, of, of terror was, oh my God, am I going to be laying off several hundred people? 
because all these places are going to close and we're not going to be able to work. And uh, I guess you never really stop being an engineer. And so my immediate reaction was, okay, we've got the stuff that our vendors have been working on that I've been NDA'd on. Nobody knew existed. And I wonder if we started to spin this stuff up in Google cloud, if it would actually work. And so we got, I got with uh, Mark at gallery software who, yes, it's the same gallery that goes all the way back to the beginnings of pro tools plugins. And he had put together some core work around running and routing NDI in cloud. And we spun it up in cloud and shockingly it worked. And then we began to build and we brought on uh, our longtime engineering uh, partner, Jason O'Dell, to, and then began to work with this team that uh, normally runs uh, an incredible density of on-prem productions to start to put together pieces, bring in switcher products and bring in audio and all of the things we had to do to crew a show, just like we would on-prem where we've got, you know, kahunas and uh, kahuna switchers and coolas and carbonites and audio consoles from, uh, you know, that are all hooked together with Dante from Yamaha. And we had to do the same jobs. We just had to figure out how to do them from people's houses. And uh, we were able to build uh, across time a, a very complete e ecosystem where I think we can do today everything we do on-prem and then some. And, uh, and it's a huge credit to this team, and it's allowed us to build an entire new business unit uh, led by Tim. And so with that, I will uh, launch into the presentation. In today's media and entertainment environments, managing real-time production workflows has never been this challenging. The demand for content continues to explode. The pressure to deliver under difficult conditions and remain cost competitive is greater than ever before. Organizations are struggling with on-premise production workflows that have grown organically over time, that were built to meet legacy needs, performance, and security requirements. When transitioning to today's cloud production environment, workflows become fragmented causing cost and complexity to go up. And you may not get the results or performance you need. Remote working is no longer a goal, but a necessity. And although moving to the cloud sounds simple, the reality is far more complex. There has been some success with remote control of traditional systems. However, moving to a full cloud implementation is the ultimate goal. So how do you tackle these challenges and give the production team the tools they need to get the job done? No one understands production workflows and the creative process like ASG does. We have solved the production challenges that impact your team's infrastructure and business with a framework for a fully cloud-based solution. From acquisition through to content delivery, we give you an efficient way to create live events using public cloud. Easily collaborate and create regardless of your creative's location while keeping data and assets secure. The ASG Virtual Production Control Room is a powerful and flexible solution that contains industry standard production tools and applications. So you can deliver your best work and bring your programs to life. Designed by ASG to be a complete and scalable broadcast quality, real-time production control room that can be used for corporate events, live performances, news and sports broadcasts, houses of worship, and education. The virtual production control room glues together all resources in a cloud container. ASG has designed an environment that allows your control room crew to access and work directly from remote desktop applications with guaranteed performance. 
your team can deliver on the most demanding workflows, no matter how many people are contributing to the production. Whether you're on-set, on-prem, or remote, using cloud, any qualified cloud partner, with Virtual Production Control Room, you can control your production wherever and whenever you need it. Collaborate in real time, no matter where you're located, simply and cost effectively. Industry standard tools allow creatives to work in familiar applications for broadcast quality switching, mixing, audio, graphics, and rundowns. And producers to create innovative productions. ASG makes event production simple for everyone. Choose Virtual Production Control Room and you'll enjoy a flexible, future-proofed, software-defined solution. You'll be in good company with ASG partners like Google, Yahoo, Electronic Arts, Comcast, AWS, and so many more. ASG is trusted around the world to protect your content and investment, reduce costs, and bring your creative ideas to life. Contact ASG for more information. ASG, real-time production expert. That's actually the first time I've seen that all the way through. Wow. Not bad, Dave. You, you, like, it's the first video about the company we ever produced, which is ironic considering <laughs> we build systems that build, you know. This video, th there might be some likes in this video thing, huh? Yeah, who knew? <laughs> um, I know that there's going to be a lot of questions today. This group is an inquisitive group that, uh, you know, is just like me and the staff I'm lucky to have. So we're going to try and give you a little bit of insight and kind of into how this comes together and why what we do is a little different than just going and grabbing a bunch of applications. And uh, then uh, I'll keep the, the PowerPoint as short as I uh, as possible. I think it's like ten or twelve slides. And uh, and then we the uh, idea is that we're going to open this up and. Uh, let you guys ask questions, uh, not only of me, but of our folks who use this every day and what's the experience like. And, you know, uh, we'll, we'll try not to make too many questions for Boten, but uh, my, my, my guidance to them was, you know, they, the, these people are your coworkers, you know, ask the, answer the questions that you would want to know. Uh, for those of you who don't know who we are, um, we uh, were a system integrator, a VAR and a managed service provider. Uh, we have about 350 full-time employees, uh, about another 250 part-time employees who are involved in all kinds of system building, production, design, installation. Uh, our headquarters is in Emeryville, uh, which if you don't know where that is, I like to think of it as the small strip of mud in between Berkeley and Oakland. Uh, or, the, or, or, or the place where they put the end of the Bay Bridge because they couldn't think of any place else. And uh, we also have offices in Southern California, uh, New York, Denver, Boston, Toronto, London, Zurich, and Sydney. And I got to say, it is truly surreal to say that out loud. 23 and a half years ago, there were four of us who started and uh, never thought we would be here. Uh, we work across, you know, uh, pretty much every part of media creation there is, and uh, and especially in the spaces that are tend to be high touch. So, what is cloud production? You know, cloud production for us, uh, in our view, can you know can mean a lot of things. But for us, it means building a facility and control rooms that are equivalent to what we build when we build something on-prem, that if there's a TD on-prem, there should be a TD who can do this from his house or from a virtual, some other physical place. If there's an, an A1, if there's a comms operator, a graphics operator, uh, you name it, it there, sh there should be that equivalent. And if you're not doing that, you're really not bringing the full uh, production control you know, into your, into your environment. And uh, 
part of our, our goal with this was to, you know, kind of become the middle, the, the, the piece in the middle that, that glues it together, just like on-prem. And we wanted to do this with familiar tools. And you'll see that, that these are tools that are just like in your control rooms at your places. Not only did we need our operators to be remote, but we also recognized that, that our presenters were going to be remote, our producers were going to be remote. And so we had to address contribution and comms and IFB and teleprompting even. And so uh, we also wanted to be able to have an environment that could, just like the facilities we build for our clients on-prem, change, be to their taste, to their needs. Uh, we didn't want a monolithic solution that this is what you always get. You know, at our heart, we're a system integrator. And that means that our job is to customize things and put them together for people. All right, let's see. All right, so the transition to cloud. If I suspect this looks a little familiar to everybody. This is where we all start. But this is also what a cloud control room can look like. Not everybody has to be at their house, but everybody can be in a control room as well. It doesn't, you know, is the, the surfaces can go where they need to go. We also recognize that contribution is going to be different. You're going to have contribution from studios. We're going to have contribution from the field. We're going to have contribution from people in Zoom calls or whatever they are. And the other part that you have to deal with when you design these systems is that these people can be anywhere. And we still are limited by the speed of light and how fast a signal travels. And so... The, these considerations all had to be taken into account. And that was one of the reasons that we thought that doing this in cloud, as opposed to remote control of a physical environment, would get us to a better place because we can make things more equidistant. So, as, you, as, as you, you, you guys will see in a bit, this is really one of our employees' houses. This is where he runs shows from his den in what I think is, quite frankly, the coolest looking control room ever. And, uh, and is a great example of what, what this is all about and the ability to have talent located any place. So while we started out in this panicky address COVID mode, Part of it we also realized was we're, we could enable talent to contribute from anywhere. And I think all of you are doing this. You know, you've got people running all kinds of calls, remote systems. But one of the things that a lot of our production company clients have faced is, you know, the limitations of where is my talent? Where do I have to fly them to? The cost of flying them and getting them there. And now in COVID time, it's 10 times worse because can I even travel? Is it safe to travel? But could, we could enable more productions to happen at a lower cost by, and at higher quality by you're being able to pick whatever talent you want wherever they are. In the process, you know, I was talking a bit about the vendors, but this is just a few of the vendors who are now in our environment and some of the key ones that really make a big difference. So we've got Grass Valley, we've got VizRT, we have Ross, um, PrimeStream on the asset management and ingest pieces, Adobe. I was talking earlier about our early work with um, the gallery software folks, that's in, in their division called Sienna. Telestream, the, the, the ingest and transcode people of all time, and on it goes. Uh, and and uh, and a couple of others that you know are, are very key are Teradici, which I guess now might be HP, uh, but allowing us to remote desktops out of the cloud for applications that weren't natively coded for cloud. And solving for audio turned out to be a fascinating challenge as a, you know, a longtime audio person, a person who ran engineering for a DAW company, 
I have to say the audio piece turned out to be much harder than even I had imagined. And, uh, and Harrison and uh, the Telos folks both have contributed in unbelievable ways. So what is this thing? So what the environment is, is it's, a, it's what's known as a, v, a VPC, which is a collection of virtual machines running in cloud. And that could be Google Cloud, it could be AWS, um, could be Azure. Uh, I will say most of our experience today is in Google Cloud and AWS. And the team that you're gonna interface with tonight is, uh, is situated in a Google Cloud. So when you look at this drawing and uh, you're going to see you know, all of the familiar pieces that you would always see in really any system functional block. You've got contribution. You've got production comms interfaces. You've got uh, content uploads of pre-produced and packages. And then of course, you're going to have an audio mixer, a video switcher, which of course ties back to tally and, and back to contribution and uh, video monitoring. You've got uh, remote contribution in the forms of SRT feeds and HLS feeds and uh, live view and all kinds of backhaul. You still have to route things and get signals from places to place. And then of course, what are those signals when they're in cloud? So this is a collection of, for the full environment, it's very much like your rack of gear. If you wanna use best of breed, you're going, you're going to have different vendors for different things. And uh, so you might have graphics from Ross in, or if you're an expression house or VizRT, if you're a VizRT house. And then, you know, and the same for teleprompting and all of the, the other pieces. But then you get into things that are not the things you have to deal with locally. Whereas locally, you might you might virtualize some of your interfaces using a KVM, but in cloud, if it's not a native UI that's going to come down over an HTML style interface, then you're gonna to have to remote a desktop, which is effectively another form of KVM. And this is where Teradici comes into play or, or other types of remote desktop because your operators have to be able to see these interfaces. You're going to have audio playback, which uh, could be queued up in many different ways. And so what each of these machines is, is a Windows or a Linux virtual machine running applications that either are close to or the same as you would on-prem or something specifically coded for cloud. So in the case of our video switcher that we're running for today, which is VizRT's vector, that was coded specifically for cloud, but can also run on-prem. Other products like Grass Valley's AMP can run in this same position, but are, very, are completely cloud native, including their user interfaces. So they don't require uh, things like charity to remote. Um, as well, now, then you are going to have uh, things like captioning and EEG interfaces or other types of cloud and AI interface. And of course, then there's the, the, the large topic of, of intercom. And for our environment, we've worked with two, invent, two vendors. We have Unity, uh, which is actually Mac-based. So that makes the cloud part a little bit challenging in terms of where the server goes. And, uh, and then we have the Telos Group's uh, product, which We'll let Marissa and Adam talk about a little bit later. And all of the, and then of course you've got virtual belt packs, you know, whether it's going to be on your, your desktop, your Mac, your PC, or whether you're going to use your phone. Or in the case of Telos, the ability to have physical interfaces that literally are people's houses with actual buttons on them. And then depending upon your environment, you may need to do multi-channel video ingest. You may wanna run asset management, but the point of this environment was to create an environment where you only put in what you need because 
just as on-prem, you're paying for what you use. With, and, and that's in the form of both the application itself and whether it's a perpetual license that you're purchasing or a subscription you're, you're purchasing or a consumption-based model that you're purchasing. And then, of course, you've got the underlying compute and storage infrastructure that's going to run underneath that. And then, of course, all of this has to go someplace. And you're going to have you know, your intercom faces on the outside world. You're going to have IFB for your talent. And, you know, they're going to be running that from their computers and their iPhones and their Android phones. And then, of course, you have to feed your content distribution, whether that's going to be Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Brightcove, whatever it, whatever it is. And then, of course, everything that, that's where you might need to store things in a, outside of your live production. So lots of lots of moving parts to get from here to there. And so our point was getting all of this to work together and interfacing it all became the key challenge. Putting individual applications in cloud isn't really not that hard. If you can load a Windows app on-prem, you can probably load a Windows app in cloud. However, getting real-time audio and video in and out of it is not as simple. And we did a great deal of experimentation and work around that topic and really wanted to see if we could base this around uh, open standards as much as possible. And so our first looks were at SMPTE 2110 and Dante, because those are the things we know as IP transport and, you know, in our on-prem world. But alas, unfortunately today, those standards are not yet in a position to work in cloud. They're designed for multicast networks. And today, the hyperscaler internet world is not a multicast world, as everybody knows. And I have to give huge kudos to the team, and especially Jan, who tried many different methodologies of using uh, VPNs and looking to contain traffic to see if we could find a way to make it work. But at the end of the day, we ended up settling in today's implementations for having the inter-process communication be NDI. As it turned out, the, the folks who worked on the NDI uh, package and protocol had really thought through uh, pretty thoroughly the world of multicast and being able to transport signals inside of it. And so NDI, in fact, works in cloud today. There are other things coming, and there's uh, internal communication protocols, like, like such as in the AMP environment, and those have some distinct advantages. But in order to create an open environment where we could have multi-vendor today, NDI was the choice. And so the person who once was not exactly an NDI fan and not exactly believed that any of this could actually work in cloud all of a sudden became an NDI advocate and a pretty major cloud advocate. It was uh, definitely the, the, the necessity ruled. And it was certainly better, even if I had qualms about those, better to have a production system that allowed people to work and produce content than to have nothing at all. Okay, so why cloud? You know, the, we wanted to be able to enable all kinds of production and lower the cost and barrier of, to entry. And so we wanted to be able to accommodate where we had physical venues, where we needed to be remote. We wanted to be able to address houses of worship, the, 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 the true broadcast world and to find a better solution than the way Remy is running today, which is certainly cost-effective. Esports has been, of course, very involved in all of in cloud production, certainly leading the way early on. If anybody had a, uh, a, had a low uh, uh, fa fear factor around running cloud, the esports community was way out in front. And of course, education which we're always looking for ways to make that more cost-effective. So the big thing that cloud gives us is the ability to 
not have to build big physical infrastructures. And, you know, it's the rent versus buy thing, but it certainly at your cost of entry, there's no doubt that it's significantly less expensive. We've done several analysis and many systems now. And, you know, one example, we have one client that we've built multiple control rooms for. And, you know, typically they will spend between 1.2 and $1.5 million, you know, building that out. And we figured that to build, figured out that to build an equivalent system for just for the control room, comm, switching, audio, inception, day one, including perpetual licenses for some of the things, subscriptions for others. Uh, we were in the $175,000 range, including services. And that's a pretty big difference. You know, you're talking potentially a tenth of the cost at inception. And of course, the ability to scale up and down and make things bigger and smaller in real time. And the other part is, you know, let's face it, the cloud hyperscalers own the global networks for the most part. They have the ability to move large amounts of data at the lowest possible latency far beyond, you know, virtually anybody else. And then of course the ability to, you know, change where your business might be centered. And we found, of course, during the pandemic, you know, that, that that's become a pretty big topic, you know, who's going to work from where. All right. So let's talk a little bit about cost. And as always, there's a range of products at a range of costs. And just like if you were buying stuff for on-prem and the big thing that's different here is that you're going to buy your software, but, and then instead of buying a server to put it on or a dedicated appliance, you're going to pay a consumption cost for your compute, your storage, your signal transport. And here's some basics to think about that as generally you think of, we think of one VPC instance for each simultaneous program feed, meaning it takes a virtual uh, production control room per virtual production. It's a pretty easy way to think about it. And just like you could, you could probably multitask and try and run a couple of different things out of your physical control room. But if you had a choice, you probably wouldn't want to do that. And uh, most co customers will end up running multiple instances, which adds to the cost effectiveness because you can duplicate your environment. Many customers will require what we call high availability. And that's the ability to have redundant paths, redundant ingress, egress, redundant compute. Depending upon the kind of production you're doing, redundancy is the same issue as it is on-prem. Larger shops are gonna replicate in multiple locations. And we have some large broadcasters we're working with where we're talking about uh, you know, doing this to begin to migrate their physical infrastructures actually in television stations. And so we're looking at the consideration of, you know, what are the nearest data centers and what is going to give us the, the best possible location for, their sig for transporting their signals. And then the other part that you always have to think about is egress or content distribution. And those are, of course, always you know per per application. Okay, almost at the end, and then you get to talk to the real humans, really far more interesting, and which is why work with us. Well, one of our clients said this, so we just decided to steal it. Which is we've been doing this for a while, uh, even before we started doing live in cloud. For us, working in cloud is has been we've been doing it as long as it's existed. Um, whether it was just transcodes or renders or storage, um, a lot of you know us as high speed storage folks. I can tell you for sure that networking experience and knowledge became pretty key to making this succeed. That we currently can deploy the VPCR at Google Cloud or AWS. So if you have business relationships on either side, 
Uh, we're pretty agnostic that way. Subject matter experts, you know, we're doing this day in and day out. And we have people who are really doing this and really running it. And that, uh, you know, we've been, that in, in truth, system integration is still system integration. The things that are the reasons that, that our clients hire us today are the same in cloud. It's about experience. It's about engineering expertise. It's about um, being close to the applications. And, and especially because of our managed services, we are often the operators. We have a big stake in, that, in this as much as, uh, as our clients do. And, you know, any way you look at it, you know, uh, in Silicon Valley, they love to call it dog food. You, know, you, you run your own stuff. And, but it has, it has driven us to, I think, an even higher degree of commitment and expertise. And on the engineering side, you know, we are longtime traditional engineers. We like documentation. We like thoughtful designs. And we like to engineer to the right level of reliability and service. And with that, we can actually, I think, let the, let the real fun start. Let me just, before the fun starts, though, I want to ask you a couple of questions, Dave. Uh, you know, one, you know, I'd like to just delve a little bit and bring you back maybe a year and a half ago when we all were going through, oh, my God, are we going to stay in business mode? All right. You mentioned it. And, you know, who am I going to lay off? And let's talk about um, from the idea to, to uh, the inception of, okay, I got to do something to, aha, the aha moment, and let's build this. Talk about, you know, that process. Talk, sort of delve, go back a little deeper into that moment and when you said, I can do this, I can put the team together to do this. Um, any, any, any memories, any, any thoughts about that, uh, what took place? Well, you know, I think, you know, the thing that hit me first is, you know, there's certainly such a thing as a cloud engineer, but the concept of a cloud engineer who had experience doing production video in cloud, not many. I mean, you might've been able to count them on two hands. And so the first piece was pulling together a team that wanted to do this, to wanted to be part of this grand experiment. And we were very lucky. Uh, we, one of our teams does uh, live event production at Google and they were, the management there was kind enough to allow us to uh, deploy that team into becoming broadcast cloud engineers. And we really all learned it together. I did, you know, the first very, very early pieces of, is this gonna work at all? But once I was convinced that it could work at all, then it was, let's find out if it really works. And, um, and that was really an incredible key moment. And uh, I very clearly remember coming, you know, setting up a meeting with that engineering team, which I work with closely, you know, have for, you know, uh, 15 years, lucky for me, uh, and saying, here's what I, here's what, Here's what I want to do. Yes, I know I'm out of my mind, but now that we put that behind us, let's let's start doing this and see if we could really do it. And uh, the, and the search began for applications because that was the real key first piece. Was you know, at that moment in time, there was no video switcher application outside of the little video mixer, which they call a vision mixer, that was built into Sienna. And uh, and on it went through every single part of the applications and tons of experimentation. So I, I think that's the biggest piece, Marty, has been the inquisitiveness of, of this team and their desire to uh, try out applications, download stuff, you know, pull down Ardor, pull down Reaper, use, uh, you know, ReSound to get a signal from here to there. And, you know, nothing was a barrier. Gotcha. All right. Well, listen, let's meet that team. You know, I think somebody once told me the best integrators know how to integrate people as much as gear. So some of, I think the real talent that you've shown here is you, you brought some talent in, in, into this project. We're getting a bunch of other questions. I'm going to put them on hold. I, you know, why don't you, why don't you introduce the team that 
built it, uses it, works it, Dave. And I think, uh, I think right, you know, let's start with Bill. You want to introduce Bill? Absolutely. So the leader, the leader of the band uh, for this group is uh, Bill Crooks, who's been a, uh, a friend, collaborator, client, and uh, luckily for me now, employee uh, for 40 years. I can I will say out loud only once. And uh, to get to innovate with him again, uh, our original first project we worked on was the first laser disc based Atari coin operated game. And so uh, uh, he leads our engineering team that uh, produces uh, very high end fit and finish uh, events. And uh, Bill, do you want to introduce the folks in the team? I would love to introduce some folks, but before we get into that too, I'd just like to, uh, to really thank, thank you guys for the opportunity of uh, hearing us out. This has been an exciting journey. We've uh, managed to take an amazingly talented team under the direction of a great quarterback. And uh, I was laughing earlier when Marty and Dave were speaking about, you know, going way back in this business. And I think when you look at Dave and myself and Marty and, uh, and Tim and some of the others on this call, I'm sure we don't measure uh, in terms of decades. We work actually measured in geological terms. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we've been in this business a very long time. The depth of experience that we hold collectively is, is wide. And so Dave tasked us to solve for several things, and uh, that included cobbling together a, an assortment of uh, software, transport, uh, solutions. Uh, and, and, and some of those things included traveling over the public internet and using the public internet as a transport and the inherent problems that you can imagine you would expect to find, like latency. If, you have a, if you're a video director, which I am, many, many years in the entertainment business with very large concerts and such. And uh, as such, uh, if I hit, if I go to cut a camera, it's got to cut right now. If it's uh, even the, the amount of latency you get a, a couple of frames or five yeah. field going through a video wall processor, you uh, feel it. In the middle of the cloud presentation. Oh, Dave, your, uh, your mic's on. Um, but at any, any rate, yeah, or yeah, in the middle of a cloud presentation. So um, so we had to solve for that. And so to do that, we, we had a team of very talented engineers at Google uh, for the ASG, and ASG being system integrators and uh, VAR. And uh, we have a list of, of, of vendors that we use and relationships with those vendors. Uh, say, for instance, Grass Valley, and I know I personally have bought hundreds of millions of dollars worth of gear from them. Dave is far surpasses me. We've all been involved in building and designing studios and production facilities for years and years. And so we put all of these, these minds at work and we went, how do we get started? And so uh, we've done it. Uh, we're, we've gotten this far. We've been working on this for a year and about three months since we had the inception. We've uh, become development partners with some very big names, including Telos, SSL, uh, Harrison, Grass Valley Group, VizRT, uh, and some big names that have been super wonderful to work with. And the results that we've gotten have been exciting. Uh, it, it gives us a lot of advantages that you don't get that maybe, I think Dave alluded to a lot of these, but the ability to rescale for the workflow is a big one. Uh, the ability to do international uh, relatively low latency communications, which is a huge jump ahead of, of satellite communications with all the uh, latency, the additional latency of having to go 22,000 plus miles up into space and back. Again, we're fighting the speed of light. Um, so this solution solves for that. And it took uh, a lot of experimentation, as Dave said, to make it elegant and to make it streamlined and to make it operational. And then we've gone the extra mile of actually using it uh, at uh, Google and other clients and finding out, you know, where the where the intricacies lay and the nuance when you go in the cloud and then uh, uh, from a, an on-premises workflow and the things that change. And that's not limited to cloud, but when we're working in the pandemic, there are a lot of nuance when you're working with remote presenters. You know, you've got to work and you've got to look at things like best practices. You've got to look at, you know, do you have UPSs? We're in, out in California. We have the West is is plagued with wildfires on top of the pandemic, and uh, there's several things to consider. And so, being able to manage that and create a list of you know best practices and and uh, and quantify that in order to manage these high bandwidth signals going to and from our premises, uh, whether that's at home and 
as I like to say, we can work, you know, pants are optional. <laughs> we can work in our underwear. We can work in swimsuits. We can wear a clown outfit. Nobody really cares, but it's uh, the work, the, the, the workflow is very smooth at this point, and it gets smoother by the day. We're continuing to develop along that. So let me introduce you to the team one by one. We're going to start with Marissa Dorn. Uh, Marissa is our uh, one of our cloud architects, uh, and we've all learned this together. And I will recall a short little uh, story when Marissa, we came in and we had built the first cloud virtual machines in the cloud. It was our first day. We were sharing our results. And Marissa said, okay, I'm an audio chip man. I know a lot of acronyms. And she goes, and I know clouds. I'm looking at one now. They're fluffy. They're white. Anything else beyond there? What the heck are you guys talking about? <laughs> and within two days, she had built two virtual machines that were sending audio and video back and forth between each other. And so she's become one of our very strong players, along with Jan, Adam, and the others on our team, and, uh, and become a leader in the cloud project. So, Marissa, why don't you say hi and introduce yourself? Thanks, Phil. That's like, uh, you know, when when you uh, invite your boyfriend over to meet the parents the first time and they, they tell, you know, the really embarrassing story, that would be, <laughs> that, would be that for me. So thank you. Um, <laughs> that's, I thought it was a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it's true. Um, it was um, a completely new concept to me. I really didn't understand that. Um, anything about the cloud? Um, but as I started to um, get a little bit of an introduction to it, it actually was a much more natural transition from uh, digital production than I would have thought, um, especially for anybody um, in the audio world who's worked with any sort of digital audio or you know um, any sort of uh, digital content trans transport. It's pretty digestible um, in terms of an engineering side. So um, it, it totally it makes sense and it's intuitive and it's not a big learning curve. So in terms of, you know, bringing in your, your a ones who are used to working on premises, um, either in live production or broadcast or whatever it is, um, it's, it's surmountable for sure. Um, and, um, I'd say, um, like learning a lot of the backend engineering stuff it has been really interesting as well. Cause not only what was my role, um, you know, working with uh, vendors like Telos and Harrison and being on regular meetings and being like, can you make it do this? This would be so awesome if you could integrate the IFB this way, which was also super fun. Always wanted to do R&D, so that was great. Um, but um, also, you know, learning how to, yeah, build a virtual machine, configure it with the right properties, know where to put it in, in the world, which data center it should be in, why, why does that matter? Um, all of those questions um, really, uh, were answered in in the creation of this, and um, we're constantly learning how to make it even better. Um, uh, so it's it's really exciting. Um, there's a lot of new things coming out in the cloud world too that will uh, constantly make the system um, better and even more reliable, and be able to do even more fun things with it. So I'm um, I'm super excited, and um, you know. I, just to like touch on it right away, because everyone's asking about latency, um, being the audio person, um, it's totally good. Um, I was really, really impressed because um, uh, some of our systems are in Iowa. And so I'm here with, uh, you know, an SSL UF8 and I move a fader and it's like immediate. I can watch it on the screen. It's immediate. There's hardly any latency. Um, it's really impressive. Um, and I love it because it means I get to stay in my house in the forest and be able to do a uh, live production, which, yeah, I live in the middle of nowhere, not the best internet you've ever seen. And it's um, still great. So um, yeah, I think that that's it. <laughs> Thanks Marissa. And, and you know, I, I'm very proud to also say Marissa is uh, in the final stages of getting her cloud architect certification right now, along with one of our other lead architects, uh, Jan Hare, which I'm, I'm going to introduce Jan now who handles uh, a myriad of solution oriented uh, issues that we've come across. Yeah, he's a, a monster at uh, writing uh, uh, server scripts, uh, IT, transport mechanisms and protocols, uh, video engineering in general. And uh, Jan wants to say a few words. Introduce yourself, please. Yeah, um, again, this was, uh, I was very excited to be going on this. I was I was one of those people that was like in high school. I'm like, oh yeah, what do you do when you're bored? Oh, I uh, built Linux virtual machines, you know, like that's 
just stuff that I would be doing. And so it's kind of neat to like, huh, wasn't actually thinking that I'd be applying that here. But, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's been really interesting and cool to see all the technology that we're able to do and how we were able to grow it. Um, you know, it's it's a whole lot of puzzle pieces and a lot of interesting things of like, here's stuff that never was expecting to be run into the cloud. You know, we're going to use this audio console that never thought that it would be leaving the room. Um, but we're going to use it to control stuff in the cloud. We're going to be, you know, uh, bridging all kinds of things in to make it actually work. And even like, you know, making making just all the connections between things in cloud work has been really interesting. Again, you know, they never thought that we were going to, the people's software and stuff, they never really thought that it was going to be doing some of the things that we're doing with it. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's been a really interesting and fun thing to help put together. Yeah, th thanks, Jan. I got to say that Jan, when he says we're connecting a, 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 a quite a menagerie of different oddities, I mean, we're talking clickers for advanced slides. We're talking several things that are uh, ne were never meant to be traveling over the, the uh, let's just say, less than perfectly reliable public internet. And, uh, Jan's been uh, <clears throat> been able to help us negotiate that, and uh, and when it comes to the comm side. That's been a very interesting thing. And part of the problem with that is that in most cloud systems, because Apple is Apple, and no offense if there are people from Apple on here, they're a very brilliant company. And one of the reasons that they're brilliant is they work within a, a, a they don't use open architecture, it's a closed ecosystem. And therefore they oftentimes don't have a lot of their virtual machine. They don't allow for Macs to be uh, hosted as virtual machines in most of the cloud platforms. There are a couple. Max Stadium is one, and, and, uh, the, but uh, it does uh, limit the number of playing options that we have to use products that only run in Mac, and one of them was Unity. And uh, so as we we're searching for intercom solutions, which is a very important part of every workflow that you you know, and the ability to ISO people in and different, different teams and have their own channels and that sort of thing. Uh, and so in addition to the audio workflows and the DAW integrations and things like that, we've, we've, uh, we have Adam Blomberg, and Adam has uh, been really running and, and exploring these options. And also uh, every one of these people is very big on creating SOPs and documentation, training others, and, uh, and informing newcomers to the team. So Adam, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, First off, I think too, being having the opportunity to be working in this platform for over a year, I want to thank Dave. Um, it's been uh, eye-opening. It's been a huge learning experience um, coming from the live sound uh, industry, um, all different aspects, and also before that, more of the recording industry. Um, but it's been a, a pleasure, and uh, it's something that um, yeah, you, you don't look back. You kind of keep going forward in this in this realm. But um, but yeah, so. There's a lot of different aspects within, yeah, I was working a lot with the comms, um, really appreciate all the manufacturers and how they bend to make their products more flexible and usable in this new environment. Um, they've been all great. So totally a shout out to many players out there for sure. Um, and yeah, like Marissa was saying too, the latency and stuff too has been great. Comms have been, um, you know, it goes, it gets challenging with some things, but then you really get fine tuned. You have something that works, but then you want to raise the bar even more. And you're like, well, could we have this? Could we work with this? I want something physical. I want more buttons or I want less. I want it just to be a flat screen or something. You know, you have this flexibility. Um, and just really quick, I think one of the biggest takeaways in this space is the scalability that. I just keep coming across, I'm like, oh, the capability is right there. Oh, you want more? Well, I can get you more in 10 minutes um, or less. Uh, and, and just working within that realm is, uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's inspiring. It's, uh, it's fun. So, but yeah, thank, thanks. Thank you, Adam. And, 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 and to your point, I mean, it's been, uh, it's been very interesting, you know, as we're looking at systems and, and you know, like Grass Valley got this a long time ago when they came up with their KRAC systems where you could actually, uh, use every bit of the the workflow was a scalable resource and as dave uh, alluded to earlier like with og racks how many of us have systems without og racks well open gear is a big part of you know a lot of people's workflow or the grass valley equivalents and so all that outboard gear and that's ter uh, terminal gear 
being able to scale that and use it uh, anywhere within your workflow and have multiple workflows where you can determine who gets how many audio uh, uh, how many audio uh, mixers are on the show or how many backhauls you're sending or how many uh, graphics machines you need. It's all scalable. And so putting all that together takes uh, uh, and, and helping integrate that for new clients is a big part of what ASG does. And we are just one team that was developing it for use at Google and for use with other clients that include some of the others that uh, Dave has mentioned. And so we needed someone that, that was uh, just crazy enough to take the challenge. And uh, so we're going to introduce you to Tim Cuthbertson, who if you added uh, uh, Dave, my and Tim's uh, uh, industry experience together, who would, uh, again, be spoken of in geological terms. And uh, so, Tim, say hi and tell us what's going on in your world. Uh, thank you, Bill. I'm not sure I like this geological term. <laughs> uh, may, may, maybe, you know, I've got three old dinosaurs or something, but, uh, <laughs> or fossils. Did you use the word fossils? That's, that's I tough. Not, I would not. No, you would not? Okay. I would so, not um, so um, about a year ago, I say, I, I, I had a call from Dave Van Hoy, and Dave said uh, something along the lines of, I've got this project that you might be interested in. And I went, yeah, okay. And uh, what, what, what might that be? He said, well, we're, we're putting broadcast production, we're putting real-time production into the cloud. And um, we kind of got there almost, but now we need to refine it. Um, and I think you might just be the right candidate for doing that. And I've known Dave for, I won't say how long, but a long time, worked with him. 20 years, 25 years ago or more, you know, at the inception or the beginning of ASG, I said, sure, Dave, absolutely, why not? Let's have a go, you know? I'm, and so so we worked it out. And um, for the last year, really, I, we've been working on getting the kinks knocked out of this thing. And much of that is with um, the vendors, to be truthful. So we've, you know, it's like it kind of, as Adam was mentioning earlier, it's kind of, it kind of works, but it doesn't quite do this or it, does work but it's not working the way that we want it to work or there's an expectation from a broadcast perspective how it should work so uh, we've we've really i would say partnered with uh any number of vendors to solve uh real-time issues for you know captioning for teleprompting for audio for um asset ingest or ingest and then asset management um post-production work once you have those assets you know in place uh, each each in isolation is a kind of a relatively simple thing, but when you package it together, uh, it becomes much much more complex. Just as um, you know, a regular um, production control room would be if you were on premise. Um, but in the last, I'd say, ten months, we've uh, managed to do a number of um, PSEs. We've done um, uh, implementations that, to all intents and purposes, are full on. As far as I'm concerned, are full on. Uh, broadcast environments and capable of producing content, um, you know, at the high at the highest possible levels. Uh, interestingly, um, what I say is interestingly is that all of the manufacturers that we've engaged with on each piece, and it's kind of it has been iterative in that sense, have been thrilled to do it. You know, oh yeah, we were thinking about doing that, and um, we've got that running in the lab. And would you like to spin it up in cloud? So we, you know, helped in some senses a number of companies transition their products or push their products in and then ironed out the kinks to stabilize it and get it to the point where it works, as I said, you know, exactly as if we were in an on-prem environment. Uh, so now uh, from the standpoint of, uh, is, it, is it implementable? Is it real world? Is it real time? The answer to all those questions are yes, 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 and yes. And the, the the net result of it is not that you know the the broadcast world has been ignorant of what's going on, but the other players that are needed to um, if you like supplement and fulfil this have also come to the table now. The the major cloud providers in terms of AWS and Google they've looked at these pieces that are content distribution and they've certainly succeeded and been doing that for a number of years. They've looked at um, you know, pre-broadcast where there is no latency issues or, or broadcasts that are pre-recorded and retransmitting them. Uh, ha however, in the last, I would say, three or four months, or maybe perhaps a bit longer than that, five, six months, uh, they've come to realize that this is a real, you know, this industry in terms of media and entertainment 
is a is a substantial in- industry and that um, there's uh, a tremendous amount of growth in it, and that the real time aspect of real time play out, real time master control, real time um, sports production, real time you know um, production control rooms are something that is worth investing in and. Certainly, they have now come to the table and partnered up with some of the manufacturers in terms of optimizing um, both compute and transport. So we've got in the we've got something now that I would consider to be um, ready for prime time. And our, our experience at ASG is such that I think we've got our bumps and bruises getting there, but uh, and we've you know lost sleep occasionally and suffered and. But uh, at this at this point now, it's it's absolutely ready to go. So um, yeah. that's my that's my view. And Bill, back to you. And hopefully, we get to talk to Mikey now. Tim, Tim, uh, I just want to thank you. Uh, one thing that I, we didn't mention is Tim, Marissa, Jan, myself, and Dave uh, operate, and, and Adam as well operate as POCs with a lot of these uh, companies that we're dev partners with, and we are able to test out things because of the size of our team and the number of. Uh, operational uh, uh, operators and the, the staff that we have and the experience that we have, we're able to try new features and elements that uh, it would take them a long time of dog food and things uh, to really get as efficiently as we do together. So this has been a really great effort uh, among not just our team, but uh, just our, our small teams within ASG, but that extends beyond the walls of that. And it's been, uh, it's been quite an experience. And it's uh, to Marissa's point, having a say in, product design coming from real world people is an advantage to all the companies that have been involved with us and they're uh, gaining as much uh, value out of that as we are. So enough of talking about this, let's show it to you. We, uh, we have with us one of our, uh, as Dave says, fearless TV directors, Mikey Shaw, wait to us, Mikey. Uh, Mike has been a long time a uh, member of the TV production community. We've worked together for years. Uh, he's been working with Dave for many, many years. He's a noted and highly awarded documentarian as well as a well-known pro surfer for another life. And uh, Mike is at his home right now, live in front of a, a Viz Vector uh, two-stripe panel uh, with the GUI on screen in front of him. So Mike, I'm going to toss it to you and let's talk about what the experience is like coming from a real world director as, as we are and taking it into the cloud and what uh, what you notice in terms of like, for me, I found a lot of advantages. What do you think? Tell us about what your experience has been. Yeah, I felt like, um, I felt that uh, I was the latest addition to the band. I felt that Dave and Bill and Jan and Marissa and everybody were building like, you're in the shed building some sort of, uh, go-kart and I was a kid peering over the top wanting to be involved but there was really no spot for me until the actual go-kart was built and they brought it to the top is to the tallest hill that we could find and they deem me the uh the test dummy pilot to jump in the thing and actually drive it and see how it runs. so um it's been a lot of fun for me it's it's been a situation where I um didn't really know what to expect uh I can tell you this, we come from big rooms and we service a lot, uh, a lot of shows and we've come off the, like you said, a lot of Snells and we come off the 9600s, like four MEs, four Kiers, what have you. And, you know, we, 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 we bang hard when we're on prem. And when I had an, when I had an understanding that they were going to bring something to the house, I didn't know if it was going to be something like some sort of router panel or what have you, but um, I have been pleasantly surprised what this team has come up with. Um, if you can see over my shoulder, I've got an 8ME full powerhouse that can do, if not a lot, if not more than what I can do on prem. And like I said, I have eight MEs. I've got seven keyers per ME. We've got virtual sets in here, uh, keyers. Just it, it's 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 a lot of fun. And the ability to actually have it at your house build is something I didn't see coming because I had the option or the opportunity to play with this thing all night. On the weekends, good thing I'm on salary because I've been ringing up hours. But literally, um, as an experience for a person who's going to be in front of it, um, it's infectious and you get better. So all I can say is I want people to have an understanding that if you get involved with something like this, by the time your TVs get something like this, they won't get off it. Your shows are going to get better based on the fact that we keep pushing ourselves to get better on it. It's almost like a adult game in the sense of 
you know, you, 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 you kind of want to keep going and making it better and getting better on it. So um, I am pleasantly surprised and um, I'm getting a lot of reps and my muscle memory is getting better and better on it every day. So, so Mike, I wanted to, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions, but one of the ones I'd, I'd like to have you kind of start with is, you know, a lot of people are uh, asking about latency in terms of for the for for the operator you know when you push a button does it happen or does it feel like it's you know two beats later and uh and you know i think that that's one of the main operator stigma questions yeah okay well here you go here's here cut here cut two cut four cut any four i'm not sure if you guys can see my screen back here but yeah yeah, it's happening really it's it feels right. I understand about the whole latency thing. We understand it about um, with a lot of the different situations or systems we find ourselves in. But no, this thing is, it's, it's hitting. Like I can hit anything. I hit anything. I mean, I'm just pushing anything right, right now. Let's see what we got here. Here's something on ME4. Here's uh, ME3. It's, it's, it's hitting real time. I wish I had a little more time to have set it up a little more to actually oh. show you some more of our stuff. But I can tell you quite honestly... It's fast. It, our previews, our presets, our keyers, our keyers are coming in. Uh, everything just here. It's your lower third in, lower thirds out. It's it's driving in. It's all. I don't feel like I'm on some B system at home. That's the that that's part. Yeah, Mikey. Let me just interject. I don't know how many of you people. I've got a frozen screen on the main spotlight presenter, so I don't know if this is translating. Yeah. But I can say that when you got to realize what's going on, Mike is in the Oakland Hills, California, in the Bay Area. The data center is in uh, Iowa, and it's coming back to Mikey via backhaul via the public Internet. And, and it, all of that happens instantaneously. It's actually kind of a miracle. Um, we and I'm, I'm, ex- I'm used to like looking at video walls with a two frame delay drives me crazy when I'm cutting a show. And uh, so we try to minimize the latency every way you can, but it's physics, right? On a video wall, they got to go to the processor and you got to, you know, scale it. So, um, but here you don't even get that. It's uh, literally feels instantaneous to the director. So, and part of, and uh, how we achieve that is we're using the tools from the gallery folks, and they have a super low latency uh, backhaul transport protocol they call Sienna TX. And uh, it, it adds only eight milliseconds to whatever your physical transport is, and it's a tunneling protocol. So that's what really allows us to have multi-viewers in real time, uh, program preview in real time, and uh, be able to you know, get a multi-viewer to a producer's house and, not, and know that they're seeing the show exactly as, the, as Mike does at his house. But you know, the, the person who brought up these questions, uh, you know, the question of what latency is, uh, Pierre Ruthier, Pierre's uh, put a question in the box here, in the chat box here. Um, let's start the conversation. Those of you may know, uh, Pierre's uh, senior architect of uh, media production at Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And now, you know, so Pierre, you've got the question, you've gotten the answer about latency, but what you're asking now about comms, right? What is, uh, what about the latency and comms? Adam, you want to speak to that? Oh, Adam might be muted. Or it's the audio guy we don't hear like usual. <laughs> there we go. There Great. Yeah. So, yeah, it depends on, I think uh, you're trying to work with different manufacturers and they have different protocols. It has been uh, in real time as far as our production workflow. Um, I've been impressed. Uh, and that's part of we're all kind of learning and absorbing this as well. And uh, trying different things with, you know, there's ClearCom, there's Unity, there's, I think there's RTS uh, VLink, there's Telos as well. And they all have something that's kind of working towards uh, being fully cloud-based or partially. And within each of these environments so far, it's been good. It's been, uh, it, there's not been a lag. I would imagine that would be a really key question where, you know, you're trying to cut a show and you hear that call on comms and where does that line up with that live broadcast? Um, with all of our mock shows and our tests, uh, it has been uh, working really well. It's been, yeah, I don't know of the actual latency, but it's been feeling like it's in real time. 
No, hopefully that's helpful. not a, not a significant delay from a production point of view. Um, yeah. I noticed uh, uh, Brian Burnett uh, posted. Uh, no, Mike Mikey's uh, internet at his house is nothing special. It is uh, Mike, Mike. Mike, what do you got there? If I remember, I, I think it's a uh, consumer level Comcast, right? Nine hundred up and down. So I mean, it's going. So I mean, and uh, we also tested on the backside. Uh, with our Wi-Fi system as well, and it's still working really, really well. So I, I, you know, obviously I make sure that, you know, we're running higher when we're actually doing something of importance. But, you know, to go through the whole gamma and to test it all, it still, it works well wireless, and it really works well when we actually run it through fiber. We like to uh, recommend for our operators, if possible, symmetrical one gig pipe. And uh, we also are using uh, Aero 6 Pro uh, routers uh, so that if they are taking a screen in, in either in Wi-Fi mode for like an iPad or something on the side um, we get the most throughput possible and it's a it's a mesh system and that's been uh, after a lot of research we finally have the best luck uh, most of our operators did I know Jan didn't have quite the same experience but um, hope that helps okay I can't. Was a question earlier from Jason Savitt uh, he wanted to know how you're handling different formats within the cloud, HDR, UHD, 2160, S SDI. And the second, you know, second question on, on the back end is how do you handle remote truck set location with additional cloud partners? Let's take the first one. Who wants to grab the first one? Handling different formats. Handling different formats. I can start it and then we're going to want to toss it to, to uh, Jan because he's really our guy for different protocols and, and uh, and uh, it's in terms of overall large formats, uh, UHD, although potentially theoretically supported, that's a challenge. That's a lot of bandwidth. That's four times the bandwidth uh, at the very least. And uh, and so we and that's going each direction. If you have back calls and multi viewers, that's a you know it adds up pretty quickly. So we recommend right now operating at a 1080p 5994 uh, format. Um, like I said, it technically is supported, uh, and the NDI, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but the NDI protocol does allow for 16, well, I think it allows for 64, but 16 channels of embed is what's supported in the system that, that we're using. Um, so uh, that'll do that. And then listen, Dan can tell us a little about like SRT versus, you know, any of the other uh, protocols that we have used for CDNs and, and export. Yeah, um, I mean, like for for getting uh, for getting like UHD stuff into the system and everything, you know, a lot of that, like obviously, you're going to be limited by whatever your upload bandwidth is. But um, really, like once you get into the cloud, like you've got a whole lot of bandwidth between the systems. I mean, kind of addressing some of the latency stuff, like off of every internet check that I've done, all of our operators, you're within about 60 milliseconds of uh, Google's cloud. And once you are getting your signal into the cloud then getting, you know, setting that between the different systems, you have uh, quite a lot of bandwidth. So handling any of those other resolutions or anything is going to be just fine. Um, you know, we've, we've done stuff of like, you know, how, how to get it into there, you know, do we want to use an SRT, whatever. SRT has definitely been um, a good thing that, you know, we'd like to lean more heavily on because um, it, it integrates into the system really well. Um, and it, it's uh, definitely like, you know, with, with a lot of options for SRT, you can have um, you can have it so that it's a lot better at kind of scaling over, you know, changing internet conditions. Um, so yeah, um, there's definitely anything on that. Let's see what other what were the other uh, parts. Of that? Let me just talk to it briefly. That there is no SDI per se in the cloud. There's, there will be a conversion to SDI, and whether it's HDR, UHD, or 4K, that's really all dependent on the on the the bandwidth and the codec. Um, you don't. You, you can certainly deal with all of those things. The internal networking within the VPC is at three gig, so there's plenty of bandwidth within within the internal network to network to move those signals around. Uh, it's a question of your source pipe in, um, in terms of uh, you know what capability you have there. And then secondly, or just to say that so, you know we we've, we've done quite a lot of work with um, Live View. So with external live view sources using the live view format, that all comes in. The live view servers will sit quite happily on VMs in the cloud and receive signals. So um, there's, I don't believe we've done any 8K stuff, but uh, 
again, it's, it fundamentally comes down to this, you know, the size of the pipe, the connection. Right. And, and it, it also depends, it depends heavily on your I.O. And there are several options uh, in terms of encoders that you can put, hardware encoders that you can put on site or in a, in a co-location that uh, you can get SDI into. Uh, for instance, uh, the uh, AMP Edge device, and there's several things that uh, they make uh, uh, that are publicly available, but the, the, in the AMP world, which is a Grass Valley offering, they've got uh, their own proprietary I.O. Uh, that, that will have a standard baseband video signal and get it up into the cloud. So there's uh, several options and more coming every day. And also kind of a point, it's actually uh, for, for cloud, Tim, we're, we're, uh, you got well more than three gig uh, bandwidth between them. Um, you, you have significant bandwidth. Uh, the networking in cloud is kind of a shared resource, but um, you, know, you definitely have well more than three gigs of bandwidth between your VMs. And we had a, we had a couple of questions about the, how this all is affected by uh, by geography. Um, people located people in sync working in multiple locations. We got that picture from that question from Pierre who wants to know uh, what happens with multinational productions. We also have Greg Kropinski who wants to know uh, comment on sync between video and audio, especially with operators in different geos. So any comments on that? So I can say one thing, and that is that they did a. Uh, one of our vendors did a test uh, with their system within the NDI framework from London to Bangkok and back. It's a 14,000 roughly mile round trip. And their uh, their round trip latency was in the 250 millisecond range, which is almost, you know, that's that's maxed out. And that's a, that's a heck of a fast turnaround. Uh, it was not using dark fiber, it was using public internet. So that's, that we know works. And they had uh, contributors all over uh, in, in, in the path of that. And the uh, latency is an issue. You know, yeah, so here. the latency hasn't been as big an issue as one, one would think. But I also say in that 250 millisecond turnaround, that was where they were hitting a U.S. data center, data center to the Singapore data center, the data center back. And so it wasn't quite public in the internet in the sense right, of right, data right. center to data right. center. But it, any way you look at it, it means that you can really do multi-geo you know, uh, because you would just have the local latency effectively between uh, your your nearest data center that you're hitting. Um, one question was about multiple formats, you know, about UHD and uh, HDR. You know, we, to be frank, this was challenging. So we have focused on uh, 1080, 60p uh, HDR, or not HDR, st standard uh, dynamic range the truth is we should be able to do any any format that NDI will hans handle at this point. But customer demand today has been really started focused around 1080, uh, in particular 1080p60. And so as time goes on, we'll, we'll certainly start testing some of the others. And we've played with them, but I wouldn't want to call it production at this point. Um, and uh, why 5994 and not 60? Well, that's because we have to interface to physical devices in the world that are pretty much at 5994, whether we like it or not. And, uh, and there, you know, I would say, you know, I think uh, the audio sync question is really interesting. One of the reasons we chose N NDI for moving things around is because audio, it inherently keeps audio and video together in its transport. And so even in our mixer, we mixer choices, we chose to use an NDI interface for the audio, which allowed us to keep things in the in the same domain. But Marissa, you wanna you wanna speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, a, a lot of this <laughs> uh, sync and latency stuff has been the name of my game for the last year and a half, and figuring out the best ways to optimize it and stuff. And in terms of you know, I'm seeing a lot of questions um, about keeping stuff in sync as well as, um, you know, latency um, compounding uh, throughout the system. The way that it's kind of structured, because it's all hosted in one place, all the compute is hosted in one place, it's, it's like a, um, it's a star topography kind of thing, right, rather than linear. So if you have, um, you know, a show caller that says go, um, 
you're going to have uh, your your screen switcher and your A1 hit that at the same time, and that 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 latency is going to be the like generally the same depending on their internet. But that's gonna that's gonna go out across that star topography to everyone who needs to hear it. Um, so yeah, and and also you know thinking about um, uh, sync when when I'm in my mixer and I choose um, an input, I'm choosing the same exact source that my TV is. And the way that the uh, the way that everything's structured in our system is um, it's all point to point. So um, when I pull, you know, my video playback source into my mixer, the TV is also pulling that into his switcher. And so it's not like it has to go to one and then the other. We're both getting it at the same time to our machines, and they're all hosted in the same data center. So they're all really close together with insanely high network bandwidth. <laughs> so it, it works really well. Um, so, and like Jan was saying, you know, I just did a little test because I was curious, and um, I just pinged one of our virtual machines, and I, I live in the middle of nowhere. And my ping time, um, and my our data center's in Iowa, I'm in California, my ping time is between like 45 and 55 milliseconds. So that's really what the numbers that we're dealing with in terms of when I send a queue, when I move a fader, that's how long it's taking to get to the data center um, for that trigger to hit. So it's really um, quite manageable. And a lot of this stuff, you know, it depends. We figured out how to do the workflow in the best way to manage these things, right? <laughs> Combination of what's technically possible and optimizing your workflow um, so that it's better. Um, you know, even within you know the Unity application, you can set a buffer size um, and and change your audio settings and stuff so that you can you can minimize your latency um, even with hearing a cue from from someone. So um, it really uh, it doesn't feel laggy at all like it feels very very similar to working in a venue um so so, so one other question that uh jeff had asked uh was you're talking about uh yeah we we yes we deploy in containers um with a vpn around that to, to provide security as well as uh guide the traffic and so your question was, you know, do we iterate those or we have a formula that works and is locked down? And so I'll answer that and say, yes, <laughs> it's a, yes, we iterate. Yes, we try to keep it locked down. Um, you know, there there's constant improvements in the software, in the cloud providers, um, the hypervisors even. Uh, in, in And so it's a balance of you know, every time you, you iterate, you have to retest and you have to go back and, and do all of that. But you also don't want to ignore the ability to produce something better. And, and so it's a balance, you know, just as it is in, in quite frankly, really in software development. We have a little bit of a, uh, we have a comment, not necessarily a question, but maybe uh, let's comment on this comment from Aaron Mike Robertson. I'll just read it. Coming at this with live, live it now in mind, the question is not about lag with switching, but we all see the lag that happens with talent talking to a guest cross country. Add to that the lag that occurs in a TD director rolling B-roll or the host or anchor asking for a specific video. It seems that the latency will compound and not linearly, but exponentially. Any comments on, on yeah. my, show, my comments? <laughs> you want to take that or? Well, I, I was just going to say that's kind of what I was trying to touch on there is that, you know, it's it, it it's not um, thinking about it that way, too. Like some of those some of those contribution methods of an anchor being on site is a very high bandwidth signal because they're trying to get the best video quality that doesn't necessarily translate to using, you know, um, a, an intercom level uh, audio stream or, you know, a MIDI trigger. Um, it's going to it's it doesn't require as much latency to compensate for the bandwidth um and jan please <laughs> yeah i mean like she was saying it's like you know it depends on how your backhaul is of that like you know if you're going over a like if you're going over a satellite or you're going over like bonded cellular or whatever like you're going to have differences on that but a lot of the stuff that we're doing is kind of you know we're, we're focused on like a home connection and depending on your transport it's like you know if you're going off of like an srt you could have like just a couple hundred milliseconds of latency on that, or, you know, tune that down even further. Uh, if you're doing WebRTC, you know, you're at, like, a lot of times you're, like, under 100 milliseconds of latency. So 
um, a lot of the a lot of the news approaches to it are definitely using a more higher latency of uh, transport. Um, and so, yeah, they have to kind of like plan for that and time for that. Um, but we've well, had some work. And Jan, you know, I'll, I'll interject there. There's one other big difference, which is when you, those are all, you know, physical transport is a problem. Speed of light is a problem. Uh, the, and those are things we certainly can't get around. But one of the things that by centralizing the production in cloud is a gain is that a lot of the compounding latency we see in those productions is because you've got physical transport across multiple systems. You've got, uh, you know, a guy on a live view, and that comes back to a cloud receive, which then gets transmitted down into a CBS data center, which then gets run through a standard switch back out on the multi to the to the producer and on it goes. One of the advantages of doing it all in cloud is what Marissa was talking about, which is all all of it, it comes to one place and you're you're doing all of the work in that one place. And that actually helps us a lot with latency because you're not doing the multiple bounces. We've got a few questions happening about the data centers. And uh, I don't know who on the team wants to address it, but I'll, you know, they, they seem to be t trying to touch on the issues. Well, let me just read a few of them and we can <laughs> put them all together in one answer. Are, are all the VMs for a single VPCR located in the same data center? Or if you found some data centers are better for video while others are better for audio. That one comes from Phil Philip Altenberg. And then we, uh, then James Snyder asked the question about it. If it isn't public internet tying the data centers uh, for this together, what type of data connection is tying the data centers together? And we just got from Trevor at Friday's. Um, the, is that Friday's the restaurant? I guess uh, well, that would be interesting. Um, did VPCR get hardware installed in the cloud data centers? Oh, Friday's film. Sorry, Trevor. Thank you. Um, and he says, hi, Dave, too. So uh, I guess you know each other. Uh, did VPCR get hardware installed in the cloud data centers, Google AWS, or is it all the ATEM routing and the separate ASG data center and just the controllers? So who wants to sort of lump these in together to talk about the data center situation? Um, yeah, Jan? I could talk about some data centers here. Um, so, uh, you know, Google uh, data centers, they actually have like a global fiber um, connection between all of their data centers. They've, they've got fiber going throughout the whole world, a ton of different connections. So really like when you're connecting to any of these, you're connecting to the nearest data center to you. And from there, it's just going off of Google's own fiber um, to get from any of the points to the points. So you're really, you're just trying to get to the closest one and after that it's quick like uh basically you know we are on the west coast primarily we're using data centers that are in the central um, u.s region and uh we've done tests of like what if we were doing stuff to the east coast instead and you're really dealing with a very minimal difference in latency between those um because yeah even if we're working on the East Coast stuff, we're still just entering the West Coast data centers and then going on Google's fiber up to there. Um, and then, uh, oh, the, the uh, hardware one? Um, no, no, this is, we're, we're not putting any hardware into these data centers. This is just what we can build with Google's offerings or, you know, Amazon's or whatever provider yeah, there, um, we end up using them. No and hardware in cloud. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying there's no no special hardware in cloud. This is publicly available compute configured in VMs. And uh, to Philip's point, it, it is not a requirement that all the VMs be in the same data center, but we find that it's a lot easier to control how things work together. So we do try, we found the best results are if we keep it all in one data center. And there was a question that referred to, uh, uh, you know, is one data center better, better for video, one for audio? We there are differences within the data centers that are being they're they're being uh, standardized more and more now. But the, the machine types available in different data centers do vary slightly, and we have tested different machines for different usage uh, to answer that question. But th those di uh, differences are disappearing as time goes on, and they become more of a uh, the same kind of load in each data center. Is that, is that accurate to say, Dave? Absolutely. You know, I, 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 you know, I will say audio was much more challenging for us to solve for than video, and that really surprised me, just kind of from a data point of view. 
but then somewhere in the back of my brain, I remembered, oh, yeah, you're an audio guy. And, uh, and it occurred to me that part of the problem was that, you know, we synchronize audio or video every frame. So let's call it every 60th of a second. We synchronize audio every sample, which is generally, oh, let's call it 48,000 times a second. And so that was a lot of what we had to solve for that Marissa and, and the team really worked hard on. And, um, you know, so from beyond that, you know, it, it actually becomes much more about the resources available in data center from the overall compute and GPU. A lot of the video processing requires, you know, fairly beefy processing, in, including GPUs. And different data centers might have different complements of machines. Um, also, for certain applications, you may need large amounts of backhaul. And that might be like through a, a, a vendor like LTN or the switch. And so some data centers have a, have a larger uh, or better pop contingent in terms of those, those points of presence. So that becomes much more an issue than is one better for audio uh, or video. That, that really isn't the issue. It's really more about you know, the connectivity and getting all the signals to all the places. Right. Another, there's another question here that really uh, sparked my interest from Paul Barry, and it's really about we're living in a gig economy, and uh, a lot of a lot of our operators are now freelance. We're not all staff. Yeah, this is not going to change. It's probably going to accelerate. Um, and so, Paul, I think it's a great question. How do you see org staffing for this model? What what makes sense is staff roles versus contractors? Are there better roles one way or the other? And most orgs need the freelance role players. And we know we're going to need more freelancers. So, uh, how does that get? In? How does that work into this mix here? And how does it? How do? What model? Let's just go back. What do you see as a staffing model for this? So, you know, and I'll answer this with, with. There's there's two parts to this answer. You know, we see this as the ultimate gig economy enabler. Quite frankly, um, you know, the fact that you can have people work from anywhere. When I was talking over the extremely exciting slides. You know, that's one of the points I was trying to make was this enables us to have operators, talent, contributors, pretty much any place. So from that perspective, it allows us to increase the pool by a pretty significant amount. Uh, you know, you know, we're in the managed services business. We do a lot of uh, ad hoc and bringing in freelancers uh, as as they're known, which is technically not a legal term that exists anymore, but nonetheless, um, the, we see that as a very large part of the operator pool and we want to enable that uh, as much as possible. And so that really comes down to training. From an ASG point of view, kind of a second part to the answer, you know, when we supply this system today, we do it in three different models. We have a model where we build it for you and we provide you training and then you know, we hand it over and it's all up to you. We have a model where we build it and we provide, you know, operator training and then we are the engineering behind it so that you don't have to have a, a cloud savvy engineering staff. And then we have a model that is fully staffed where quite frankly, all the operators on that side are all, uh, you know, freelancers and, uh, we have been working to build a bigger and bigger pool of those folks um, in our system. Uh, we have about 300 onboarded today, and we're working our way through trying to provide training uh, and build that pool all the time. All right. Well, listen, I'm going, I, get, I get the wonderful distinction to be able to ask, have the last word here and ask the last question. And um, so let me ask you this. Uh, you've been into this, I think, Bill, you said what, a year and three months, 15 months. Um, that was obviously accelerated. You probably, you know, like all of us, we would have taken our sweet time with these things, but we just didn't have choice. And as Dave sort of started out, and we had no choice. We had to save jobs, get productions moving. So let's talk uh, this near future. Let's talk over the next year. How much better is the, the VPC, the ASG VPCR going to be a year from now? And what is it going to take from talent, technology, the vendors, uh, to make that happen. 
You're on the hot seat, Bill. You want this one? <laughs> oh, okay. I'll take a whack at it. I was I thought for sure you'd have a really brilliant answer to that. We're continually incrementally growing the capabilities and streamlining the system. So I can tell you this, it's going to be better in every possible way with the relationships we have with our current relationships with the vendors that we're using now and others to come. The industry is embracing this in every day in a greater way. And uh, as such, we are finding new uh, new functionality that we're gaining through those relationships every day. Uh, the examples being Grass Valley's group of the, of the world, of the world, the uh, the SSLs, the Harrisons, the Telos, and uh, and all the other people are jumping on board. And the more users we have, and the more uh, we can sustain a an ad hoc and staff uh, growth and training within the cloud infrastructure, the sky's the limit. It represents a lot of advantages over on-premises uh, systems. One of the advantages that it does offer. Not only is it scalable and mobile, uh, it is uh, upgradable at a much lower cost. Uh, the, the, your, your hardware doesn't become uh, obsolete. Uh, there's not built-in obsolescence in gear. It's, uh, its life cycles are longer because it's all software. And just as we know, using PWAs in the cloud or even pretty much all the Google apps with the G Suite, the, the heavy lifting is done in the data center. And uh, for that reason, I think there's a huge history I mean, I, I, there's a there's a short history, but a huge future in front of us in this. And uh, I would I would bet my career on it in a half, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, Can David, I say one other? Thing? Sure, go ahead, please. Thanks. Um, one one other thing about that, I think um, the more people who use it, the better it will get. Um, the more right. it, the more it scales, the more instances we have um, the, the, the better it will be. Um, in addition to that, I was going to say a lot of the, some of the components we're using are cloud native as, as Dave talked about, they were built to be used in the cloud, but more, more of the pieces are what's often known as lift and shift um, where it's something that was built for on premises and we've adapted it for the cloud. And I think what's going to, what we're going to see is a lot of, um, you know, the, the vendors that we um, have been working with and others as well, um, taking um, a more cloud driven approach and creating things that are cloud native, um, where it, it's, it, we don't have to worry about, oh, there's no multicast. Um, they're like, oh, yeah, we know. We made it so that we don't even have to think about that because <laughs> it's built for cloud, things like that. So I think it's it's going to like rapidly um, get even better. All right. Well, that's a, that's a great way to end this. And I just want to thank ASG team, all the great work you've been doing. Keep it going. Keep, uh, keep let's 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 see where this goes in the next fifteen months. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Mikey, and thanks for the, re the rest of the team there. Uh, thanks particularly for to everyone here who's stuck it out. It's a little gone a little longer. I'm usually pretty pretty tight where the but the questions were great. And uh and and I'm, it's because of those questions that these become these these conversations become fun um and continue to be uh, fun. We'll be we'll be back here sometime in September. I always sort of uh look for uh look for hot topics, a couple things coming. Jim Skim, Skinner from Facebook wants to do a redux on HDR, so we're talking about that. Uh, we're also talking virtual productions, getting a lot of uh, buzz right now. So uh, expect a session on virtual production, if not September, coming up. And who the hell knows what's going to happen with NEB these days, but that should bring us good fodder for conversations. And uh, we'll, all, we'll all hope for the best with that. Um, I'll pass it. You know what? I can't have the final word. Let me give it to DVH, Dave. Um, any final thoughts before we we hand it off? Uh, mostly, Marty, thank you for putting together this org and, uh, and giving us a platform to give these kinds of presentations and uh, talking me into uh, something I didn't think I wanted to do, but you were right, as usual. And uh, yeah, I want to thank all the attendees, the members of the group, uh, my team, who, by the way, you guys rock tonight. You always do, but today especially. And... Um, you know, and thank you from the, the community you know, who supports us and uh, pay, helps us make a living. And I think uh, we'll wrap it with that. Thanks a lot, everyone. See you next month. Spread the word, by the way. When you get when you get our promotion, by next, please bring bring a friend. You know what? We want to keep, continue to grow this thing. 
So thanks again. Have a great evening. Go get some dinner. See your, hug your wife and kids, your dogs, and we'll see you next month.